Jubilee phase two. I want to show you guys around. Sun's going down. Wait for a couple people to come in here. Live in five. I guess you guys don't need to see me. Damn, Phil, I have a shaky hand. Do you want to hold this thing? <laughs> Are you really Mr. Steady? Yeah, I'm like Mr. Wobbles over here. I need to, uh... What up, guys? We got a couple showing up. Jubilee Phase 2, we're almost out of here. Phil, you ought to hold this thing, bro. I, I'm definitely shaking. Yeah. Oh, there's John. What up, John? My man Phil here is on the phone, so he can read the questions, and maybe we'll do a little Q&A towards the end. We got five showing up in under a minute. Oh, look at that, Phil. Clean, clean. <laughs> we've, uh, we've got some Arbaquina olives right over here. And then we have some silver saw palmettos, mealy grass, and then um, Simpson stoppers kind of staggered in between. So this is kind of the entry point. You know, Jubilee is 12 acres, so we're back for that phase two planting. We originally did a three acre install over here on the far side. So I've done a lot of filming here during this whole cleanup installation process and before we've gotten this edited and up there for you all to check out I figured we'd give you a little sneak peek we're pulling out of here tomorrow about two o'clock so we'll kind of walk you guys around a little bit while we still have some daylight you can kind of see here behind us as Phil will kind of pan you know this is that finger link entrance kind of coming in so everything from here back is 10 acres and there's a two acre parcel up there so the you know the driveway is kind of hidden from the main road and it comes in and it starts to open up here to what we just did so everything over here on this side is the phase two expansion which was originally just supposed to be a nif planting and had transitioned to some edibles natives um, pond plants really uh, just a mixed variety of species definitely been a lot of fun very Im intimidating getting through this large pile of mulch that was actually once here so this whole center island that you guys see just behind these two native cabbage palms we just installed was about maybe 1500 yards 2000 yards of mulch so you know to finally get to the bottom of that is uh, an accomplishment in itself for us you know it feels good kind of you know we're getting to the point here where we can see the end of the day we've got some royal poinciana's in over here we've got some gumbo limbo's in over here um, we've got an olive at the front and we'll just kind of walk around a little bit and phil if there's any questions coming in just read them mm -hmm. off to me as you get them if somebody wants to visit the nursery. Somebody wants to visit the nursery. Give me a call or text. We've been. I'll be back in town Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So please give me a holler. This is the far north side of the property over here, and over in this area, we've built basically a buffer to kind of hold, or hide, should I say, and screen the nursery area, the the implements for the tractor, pots, a lot of that back of the house stuff that they don't want to see. It's kind of more or less hidden back over here. So once those sea grapes come up, that'll build build a bit of a wall. We have a lot of native Fakahatchee grass there. And then obviously once the cabbage palms get their foliage again, that'll be a little bit more filling. So really didn't do too much all the way up there in the front. But as we kind of come in this way, you could see, I mean, there's no lack of mulch here. And, you know, we estimate at least $100,000 in free mulch on this project. So when I first came out here, it was 2015 in October. We, you know, we, we had discussed with Ryan his goals for the property. And the first thing we told him was to get mulch, call these tree guys. And Ryan had never stopped um, this mulch. Obviously we used over a thousand yards on phase one. I'm guessing somewhere around seven, 800 yards here on phase two. And somewhere in that time while I left and came back, the caretakers probably used another 200 yards. We actually installed some Bahia grass. I'm not big on installing grass, but this was just pure sand over here. And this will just be unirrigated Bahia, kind of a sustainable lawn. You can see that's our real centerpiece olive kind of stepping over here into this area. And I, I don't know which way we should go through this. We're definitely limited on light, so I don't know if we should cut left, cut right. Phil, I'm just going to follow mm. you. Okay. How many do we have? Um, Is that yeah. number on the top? 13. 13. All right. Tuned in. We used a lot of this native cord grass here. So we used cord grass, mealy grass, and Fakahatchee grass as our, our clumping native grass species. This is a really nice olive. 
it had the, the best form, so we kind of set this one by itself. And originally, these olives were actually supposed to be in that center island. And because they're such statement trees, you know, such dooryard trees, we had kind of made the decision to stick these up towards the front of the property and really make them that statement piece when you pull in, the first thing you see. So you can see, I mean, that these things are they're unique. They're different. They're silver. You know, they're airy. They're definitely, uh, you know, the tree can be 150 years old, 200 years old, so it's going to outlive them. Phil, I think I should let you talk about what's in this pond since you're the one that kind of planted it. But we have a couple of retention mm. ponds that were originally just built because they need a house. Um, and we've been working with them, you know, and the homeowner asked me, you know, when we originally came up with the pond idea, you know, what ecological function will a pond have here on this property? And it actually has lots of ecological function. You know, even though we are on the water, we're on the salt water. This is fresh water. So this is gonna attract different species of birds, different species of beneficial insects. I mean, there's been no lack of dragon flies here. You know, that's probably one of our best predators for mosquitoes. So, you know, obviously having that source of fresh water, that's attracting all those beneficial insects. There's been dragonflies, and we've just planted this out. So this looked pretty terrible before we got here. And I'll kind of talk about what's on top and maybe Phil can chime in on what he's planted along the edge. But on the south side, we have a 45 foot clumper. They're not quite there yet, but that's an old hammy eye bamboo. These trees right here in front of us are just some cypress trees. We have some silver saw palmettos behind the bamboo. And then we have cord grass again. And if you kind of pan this way a little bit, we've used some red, you know, red cedars here. And that's another very common native pond species that you always see, you know, in native habitat. And that usually comes right after the cypress. You know, if you're in the woods or something, that would be that next species you typically run into. So we used a lot of those around the outskirts of the pond. This grass that's actually over here on the west side of the pond just kind of showed up on its own. So we, um, you know, we're not taking it out. We're leaving it there, obviously. And trying to tell them what you've planted around this thing, Phil. Yeah, added a little pickerel weed down here along the bottom. And that one has an edible function, right? Yeah, uh, I believe so. I'm not entirely sure. But then we got some spike rush. I know it's really hard to see, but spike rush grasses around here. And it goes in over here to the yellow canna lilies, the canna flacidas. And then we got the uh, Sagittaria Antifolia, which is a small little arrow leaves in there. I know it's really hard to see, but yeah, just kind of pretend it's there. So <laughs> they will be coming up. And if you bring the camera to, or the maybe real low in front of us, they can see what we're talking about. So all these little plants we just put in, these were from um, Aquatic Plants of Florida. They just delivered and dropped these off to us about a day ago. No tags. We had to figure out what they were on our own. Phil kind of took care of that. Yep. Then we got the uh, duck potato over there. Let's see if we can get a little closer. That's got the edible root tubers. That's the Sagittaria uh, latifolia. Oh. Man, look at you panning like a pro. <laughs> Thanks for signing in, guys. We're going to do a little Q&A at the end, so if you guys have any questions about Jubilee or this project, I will uh, go ahead and answer them for you. We're not cutting any greenhouses in this episode. <laughs> There's also uh, some alligator flag over here I put in some of the... Uh... You can actually hear the frogs. You can see the dragonflies. I mean, this little space, it's already kind of starting to come to life. Yeah, looks really nice. I can't so, wait to see it in a year. <laughs> yeah, so we come back in a year. This is obviously going to look a little bit different. It has a little ways to grow and a lot of filling in to do. And I know you guys want to see that three acre food forest over there. I mean, that thing's just out of control 10 months later, but we're going to go through this area real quick and we'll work our way over there. Is it possible to grow apples in central Florida? It is, but probably not worth it. I think they have like the Anna Dorset. And... The Anna and the Dorset are the ones with the low chill hours. Yeah. And you know, the, the problem is they ripen in the summertime and the, with all the heat, they tend to be a little bit on the mealy side. So there's so many other great things in central Florida, like mulberries, persimmons. I mean, if you're in a really cold area, I'd push citrus also. You won't have the greening problem. Um, you know, peaches I would do, plums. Uh, I just haven't found a good apple yet. I think the Anna and the Dorset are kind of terrible. There's a lot of better things that you could probably be growing. Jujubes, pawpaw, um, you know, a little bit more cold hardy species for up that way. But there's another olive, uh, Big Simpson Stopper, Gumbo Limbo, Vitex. We'll just kind of walk through here and this is, um, 
you know, some unique things that were planted over here in this space and something we don't typically plant is citrus. Uh, you know, being down here south of Tampa, we have a really bad problem with the citrus greening. Um, you know, these trees, when we get them, have a tag on them that says ISD, metacropin soil drench. So that means that tree was just drenched in a poison. You know, when they first started this drench to keep the greening away, that was good for a year. Phil just picked those trees up the other day. He told me they were good for three months. So I think they're starting to realize that you have to douse them even more to keep the greening away. So why I started this conversation, what I want to point out, and while my consulting work we do, we do run into some citrus that's unaffected by the greening. And typically it's in that understory situation. It's underneath an oak tree. So we're trying a couple of citrus trees here. We have them underneath the oaks, you know, for us being in this area, we think that's our best chance for success. That biochar, compost tea, um, you know, there's, there, there's a few things to kind of help with the citrus if you have to have it. So let's work on <clears throat> Yapoon Holly, you or wanna, Ilic Vomitoria. You want to explain what greening is? So greening, um, it's basically like the AIDS virus. It's a small bug. It's a psyllid that actually affects the nutrient uptake of the plant. And because citrus was grown, you know, as a monoculture throughout the state of Florida for a long time, nature found a way. So that that way, you know, was originally canker and now is greening. That I've heard that greening is even starting to show up in California. Um, but basically, it's it it makes it almost impossible to grow citrus in the central region. You know, USF right now is. You know frantically running to genetically modify citrus unfortunately so you know who knows what it's going to be with citrus but i can tell you i just did that panhandle tour if you guys haven't checked it out check it out and i was eating citrus and it was like just bringing back memories from a kid so i'm not knocking citrus i wish we could grow citrus but until we get this thing in check you know they did just come out with some type of fly you can release that supposedly eats the psyllid i don't have any success i don't know anybody that has with it yet but you know it does give us a little bit of hope so here's some of those citrus trees you know there's five or six different lemons limes oranges tangerines kind of in that drip line of these you know live oaks so we're we're trying them we're keeping them over here in this space we're running out of daylight so i gotta yeah, stop yapping dirt. somebody you asked about growing uh papayas in a mediterranean area papayas in a mediterranean area i think with enough water you'd be fine yeah I know people that have grown them, you know, way north of here as a as a annual vegetable. Here they're perennial. So these are one of, one of our citrus trees, and this is what I was talking about. So applied 11:30. I mean, these guys dated this before they even, you know, we got them a day ago. Supposedly they're saying they did them 11:30, but they're good for three months. This is a mercot. I believe this is an orange, right? I don't know. I don't know my citrus very well. I'll be honest with you. So I'm not even going to pretend to. Learning the citrus. But this is that stuff we were kind of trying to hide over here towards that northern part of the property. Big compost pile, nursery area, greenhouse area, implementations for the tractor. You know, kind of the back of the house. Got a neat little seating nook over here for the kids. And lots of new mango varieties. So the main thing that we added in over here on this extension of the food forest are a lot of these new Zills varieties of mangoes. And it's really exciting. I'm talking peach cobbler fruit punch, orange sherbet, um, you know, just pineapple pleasure, a lot of these new ridiculous flavors that weren't available actually when we originally in 2015 came up with the plant list for this property. So, you know, as we're doing the expansion, we're definitely bringing in a couple of things that we didn't originally add and actually some species that didn't do good over there on the far south side of the property. So we're on a 10 acre property and we're literally like the desert over here on this side and it's the swamp over there on that side. I mean, I can <laughs> stick my finger in the ground and it's wet and this is pure sand. So for being one property, you know, it's really amazing the difference in diff you know, deviation in species that thrives over there and doesn't thrive over here or thrives over here and won't <clears> thrive <throat> over there. And we found that out the hard way, like firebush, sweet almond, doesn't do well over there. We're bringing it up over here. So, you know, here's our native firebush. Does well in the understory. Put a Japotacaba over here. Japotacabas love water, but they don't love constant water. So we're having a problem over there with the Japotacabas, a lot of the Eugenias. We're trying them out over here in more of the shade area. And we also added some grafted jackfruits throughout this space. So you wanna show them uh, how deep that mulch is? <laughs> Did they ask? Yeah, somebody asked how deep Oh, the it's mulch. deep. So there's our micro line that runs through here that feeds our main species of fruit trees. And I would say this is at least 12 inches. So, yeah, you know, you're, we, we you're, spent... You're eight inches at least deep and you're not even to the soil yet. Yeah, so we spent 13 days as of today on this project. Tomorrow will be day 14 and we're out of here. 
we spent five days removing invasive species properly, you know, digging up the roots, getting the Smilax out from the roots, we really put that time and effort, you know, hopefully down the road, it gives them success and less maintenance in these areas. So, you know, by mulching thick where we don't have the plants, that's also gonna help to suppress the weeds as the canopy establishes. We don't get a lot of light down here. We shouldn't have a, a real weed problem. Right. Um, but here's a really neat seating nook, kind of over here in this area. Something for the kids, you know, this has firebush and papaya. We even brought in some angel trumpets, um, passion fruit. Mm -hmm. There's another passion fruit, a couple of bananas, Thakahatchee grass, even a couple of cigar plants just, you know, for the, for the hummingbirds. Um, something that we just recently did, we actually extended this whole windbreak that was originally stopped all the way down there at that oak and brought that graceful bamboo all the way up. So we've really closed in the property here with the bamboo mm -hmm. bricks. You know, we have a, a wind ramp now in the center of the property. We have a huge windbreak all the way around the entire property. Let's start walking towards some light, Phil. We gotta show them the good stuff. We have a whole three acre grove you guys gotta see. Hold tight. Lots of pineapples in this area. That's another one. You know, the, the canopy is sparse here, so it actually gets a really good dappled light. You know, I know you guys see bananas. Bananas are rocking over there in the wet area. We've added some in for the texture, for the tropical look throughout the space. Another little seeding nook, more passion fruits, lots of native cabbage palms, new variety of mango, look that one's a fruit punch, another citrus, Malika, that was another one we didn't get on phase one, that's a huge, amazing, really delicious mango. This is a diamond. This is a late season New Zills variety. This is another delicious mango. Our nitrogen fixing species here is Mimosa uh, strigolosa. We also use some native um, wax myrtle as a nitrogen fixer in some of the areas here. And also, I believe we have some peanut in a couple of spots. But this was really fun for us because, you know, the whole grove that we did in February, which is, you know, less than a year old, was very linear, straight lines. You know, we got over into this area and we were really able to play, you know, and, not really. Oh, so this is a sweet tart. This is an amazing mango. Over here on this side, we have some oaks that were actually added. We have some white sapote. We have some more firebush and yapoon hollies. Lots of neat native species. That's that grafted white sapote. There's a couple of fioja pineapple guavas for y'all up in the north. Grafted pineapple guava, definitely worth growing. Do we plant moringa? Moringa. We planted 500 moringa on phase one. We'll show you here in a second. 500. 500. So we just planted 4,200 plants over here in phase two. We planted about 11,000 plants in phase one. So we really, you know, we put a lot of ground covers, a lot of support plants, a lot of fruit trees. We didn't mess around with the numbers or the density. We look at the plants as the weeds. You know, you plant the plants you want, or you're gonna get the weeds you don't want. So it's very important. Like we're gonna be adding some more mimosas in some of these spaces tomorrow. But I guess you could pan real quick over this. There's gonna be big red Royal Poinciana's coming down the center. Um, this side along over here has the Manila Tamarins. The other side over there has Gumbo Limbo, and then mixed native species throughout that can handle shade. Uh, sweet almond did terrible with the wet soil. We've added a lot more over here on this side. Obviously extended the palmettos. But when I brought these sweet almonds, they had zero flowers on them. This is cold hardy to North Georgia. So for y'all North, this is definitely worth growing. One of my favorite plants for attracting beneficial insects. Everyone died in the grove in that wet soil. They like water once they've been planted and to establish. After that, they don't like water at all. They actually hate it and they won't flower. So these had no flowers on them two weeks ago when I got here. It's been in the ground a week, a week now, and it's yeah, already got no flowers doubt. on it. So, you know, nature happens quickly. And I have a more detailed tour coming out, you know, of this whole property. Those grafted jackfruits over there, some more of these citrus going under the oak here on the right. And we have another small pond. I saw a question about a tomatillo or something. Tomatilla? Or, yeah, I think so. Tomatillos. I, I think they grew some in the, in the market garden. 
I believe they're annual here, so they grew them in the uh, you know that market garden area. Here's the other pond that <clears throat> Phil knocked out of the park. We haven't finished spreading the mulch here. You know, this one also has old hammy eye on the back. Has sea grapes. Bamboos. All right, another small pond with the Chipotacaba coming over the edge of it. Thought that would be kind of cool. Also has those um, those red cedars, a couple of cypress trees over here in this corner, and all the same species of pond plants. Let's show them over here real quick, and it's getting late. Yeah. We're gonna have to call it quits. We want to get some dinner. We've got to get back home to our family tomorrow. But you guys, I mean, you, you're not gonna believe this over here. So, you know, obviously we just finished this today or tomorrow. You know, we finished this 10 months ago over here. They just harvested 800 pounds of sweet potatoes from this space right here. Six different varieties, sold a bunch to a restaurant, recovered it with mulch, prepped the ground to replant the slips. Not much space for 800 pounds of sweet potatoes. Who said that? No, me. Oh. <laughs> I'm saying that. Oh. This is actually a giant solar barn. This property is net zero. That's covered in solar panels facing south. Superstructure. Mexican sunflower for days. Oh my God, I can't even break it off of here. I love it when they flower. They're absolutely amazing. Um, lots of euc uh, eucalyptus. This was inspired by Ernst Grouch. Uh, lots of edible leaf hibiscus, rosemary. This row up here, because we're up towards the far north side of the farm, is much drier. This has all figs and avocados. So if you look in here, I mean, I planted this tree less than 10 months ago, and they've been eating figs off of this almost every day. Wow. Cherries off of the cherry. Racks of bananas have already been harvested. There's probably 25 racks of bananas hanging right now. Um, you know, you look throughout this food forest and the diversity, there is no one species. You know, the main fruit trees haven't taken off yet, so a lot of those, you know, uh, mangoes, lo you know, longans, lychees, those are still very small. You know, they're still in the immature age, but the bananas, the support plants, I mean, they're really starting to thrive. So this is that entire market garden space over here. And that's about a quarter acre market garden. Let me get over the hedge here so you can see. And we are running out of light. Can you see, Phil? Uh, it's, it's getting, it's dark, but we can see. Okay. I'll get to place so I can get steady. pretty good all right we're gonna wrap this up we're running out of daylight Phil thank you you're rocking it out here holding the camera as you guys can see I'll get you some better footage throughout this food forest but every one of these bananas were planted from you know single stem bananas if you look over here there's six seven eight you know they're digging pups off of these they've harvested racks of bananas we're talking less than a year very abundant you know everything is thriving out here if the kids come out into the grove they get lost you can't even see them from the house because it's gotten so dense so. we didn't show them the dragon fruit somebody asked about that oh okay let's sneak over there come on there's no fruit on it but we'll show you where we have them growing yeah, definitely a dragon fruit all right any other last minute questions we can bang out some q a and we're gonna call it how long has it been phil uh the timer uh 23. 23 minutes that's a long video So here's the grapes. We planted muscadine grapes here. 10 months later, you know, look at this. There's already grapes. Pearly. Pearly. Muscadine. Muscadine. Barbados cherries in the center. They have fruits on them right now. And this is how we planted the dragon fruits. So I'm getting the dragon fruits right here. So here's your dragon fruits. Longevity spinach understory, fakahatchee grass in the back. I believe there's some coral bean in there. That's a native nitrogen fixing species. And you can see the passion fruits have really engulfed the trellises. So this space has some different trellised items. It has grapes, dragon fruits, and passion fruit. And you can see we put them on big cattle panels. And this one already has fruits hanging on it. Look at all that passion fruit. Yep. All right, we're running out of light. Thank you all for watching. I will give you some real edited videos during the process, um, kind of a whole walkthrough of the installation. So hope you guys enjoy. Don't forget, like, subscribe, share, and most important, pound it. I never did the what's growing on. <laughs> Damn.